And this leads me very happily to our next speaker of today, Nicole Friedli, who is also part of the Alps team, um, taking care uh, particularly of communication internally as well as externally. She was interested since her childhood in psychoactive or psychedelic substances, hopefully not through self-experimenting. <laughs> um, <laughs> She studied in Zurich biology as well as psychology, where she also uh, already during and after her studies were involved, uh, was involved in various research projects, and also part of the lab of Professor Boris Kedno um, at the lab of the Psychiatric uh, University Hospital of Zurich. Um, and today's talk basically will be around her master's thesis, which was an MDMA, particularly whether MDMA is neurotoxic to humans, investigating the white matter alterations. And that being said, let's give a warm welcome to Nicole. Thank you very much, Philip, for these kind introductory words. As Philip has just announced, I'm going to talk about whether MDMA is neurotoxic today. I guess or I hope that many of you are interested in the answer to this question. However, I know that there are many students in the room who might be interested in how to end up in MDMA research during a master's. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about how I ended up there. Philip has already mentioned a few things. So my interest in psychoactive substances actually began during my childhood. It's kind of a funny story because we had a family friend, she was an elderly lady and she was working at the psychiatric hospital that was close to where I grew up in Ville St. Gallen. And she took me to the addiction ward because she wanted that I get scared of psychoactive substances, like alcohol, like drugs. Um, by the fact that I'm standing here today, you probably can infer that this was not the case. The opposite happened. I got really interested in what pills can do, what these tiny little powders, what these liquids can do to the human brain. So I started, I was still a child, but I wanted to do some research on these kind of substances. So I started reading a lot of trip reports on various substances, and the one that hooked me the most, for whatever reason, I don't know, was MDMA. So fast forward, around seven years later, I started studying psychology and biology at the University of Zurich. And at an event of the Fachverein Psychologie, for those of you who study at the, um, at the University of Zurich, you might know them, um, I bumped into Professor Boris Gedno, who has Philip already mentioned, um, who was holding a talk on his research on cocaine. So I went to him and I asked him whether it would be possible to write my bachelor thesis on the topic of MDMA. And luckily he agreed. And so I wrote my bachelor thesis on the effects of MDMA on the visual system. And after I finished that, he was so kind to invite me to do a research internship at his group at the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich, which you can see on the bottom in the middle. Um, after I finished that internship, I also did my master's thesis um, in the lab on the topic I'm talking to you about today, that was um, whether MDMA is neurotoxic in humans or white matter alterations in um, chronic MDMA uses. I'm not only going to talk about my master's thesis, we have last year um, published the results, that's the paper over there, um, so I'm of course going to talk about the final results and not only the interim analysis of my master's thesis. So I'd like to begin from the start. What led to the hypothesis that MDMA may be neurotoxic to humans? Let's start really from the beginning. So MDMA is short for that very long term that I'm very hesitant to speak out loud, but you can read it by yourselves. 
Um, it's usually sold, or if we say MDMA, we usually refer to the powder or crystallized form. But there are also pills that mainly contain MDMA, and these are called ecstasy. You can see a few example on the a few examples on the slides. These pills were tested in Switzerland very recently. So MDMA and ecstasy are or is a serotonin or adrenaline and dopamine releasing drug mainly. It also releases other neurotransmitters, but they are um, these are released the most. And serotonin is responsible for the psychoactive effects of the drug, while noradrenaline is responsible for its stimulant effects. MDMA is usually classified as an intactogen, that means producing a touching within. The acute subjective effects um, are or range from euphoria to increased um, social interactions to increased extraversion and so on, but it can also create hallucinations. So we say that it's an intactogen, but it also has psychoactive properties or psychedelic properties, of course, it's psychoactive. Um, in papers on MDMA, people or authors usually write that it's a party or a club drug. We can, in fact, see in wastewater analysis that the drug is mainly consumed on the weekend compared to the weekdays, which is an indicator of it being a club drug. We also saw during the COVID lockdowns that MDMA use decreased. Thus, we can also infer that um, it's being used in clubs. However, the Drug Information Center in Zurich reported that, that the relative amount of ecstasy and MDMA probes being tested there didn't really decrease during pan the pandemic. And this is an indicator of or that the substance is not only used in the club setting. We've also heard today that it's also used um, as an adjunct to psychoactive therapy, especially for the treatment of PTSD. We've still not answered my question on the slide, what led to the hypothesis that MDMA may be neurotoxic to humans? Well, what we can see in chronic MDMA users is or are molecular alterations in the human serotonin system. For example, we see a reduction in the density of serotonin transporters and also serotonin depletion in the users of MDMA. What we also see are neurocognitive deficits in chronic MDMA users, for example, issues with learning, with memory, and also with executive functioning. What really led to the hypothesis that MDMA may be neurotoxic to humans were animal studies, though. You can see on the slide, on each side, um, a picture from one of the very first studies that showed that MDMA is neurotoxic to animals. So on the left side, you see a brain slice of a monkey who was treated with MDMA, and on the right side, you see the brain of a control monkey. And you can see a really severe axonal degeneration in this brain slice after the administration of MDMA to these monkeys, or to the monkey on the left. However, it's very important to note that findings in animal studies may not apply to, human, to humans. For the case of MDMA, there are several reasons for this. One of them, a very important one, is that MDMA dosing is very different in animal studies, or oftentimes at least, in animal studies compared to how humans use MDMA. So in animal studies, usually higher doses are administered and also in a higher frequency that recreational MDMA users would consume the substance where you maybe, you sometimes have MDMA consumers who only um, consume it maybe 10 times per life. Whereas in animal studies, they don't really have breaks between the dosing sessions. And as I said, the doses are also higher. Then what's also different between animal studies and how humans consume MDMA is the route of administration. In animal studies, MDMA is usually, usually injected, while MDMA um, is usually consumed by humans orally. You can also snort it, but usually it's consumed orally. And what's also different between animal models and humans is MDMA metabolism, and that can also have an impact on whether the substance has neurotoxic properties or not. 
So, of course, we're still interested in whether MDMA is neurotoxic to humans. So how can we find out whether MDMA induces axonal damage to humans as well? The problem is we cannot use the same methodology that we use in animals. Of course, we need to first um, investigate the effects of MDMA in vivo in the living human. And another reason is that we cannot just like create two randomized groups and have an experimental design, but one group gets the, the placebo and the other group gets the MDMA and then we just see what happens. Of course, we cannot do this in humans. But, good news, there is a method. Um, we can use diffusion tender imaging. The short form of it is DTI, and I'm going to refer to diffusion tender imaging with DTI from now on. And diffusion tender imaging is conducted with an MRI device. And I just want to very briefly explain how it works. So we have, of course, water molecules, a lot of them in our brains. And what water molecules usually do is when they're not restricted in their environment, if they can move freely, we have what we call isotropic diffusion, what you can see on the left side. However, in accents, where we found in animal studies um, degeneration due to MDMA, this diffusion is restricted by the accents because they're so very tiny. Water molecules mainly move along the y-axis, so along the nerve fibers and not in the other directions. And that's what the MRI or DTI actually measures. Um, out of these diffusion directions, we can then calculate a measure which is called fractional anisotropy, or FA, which is a measure of white matter integrity or macrostructural changes of white matter. Which white matter, I maybe need to mention this as well, is where the axons are like located in the brain. Um, before we started our study, there actually were a few studies um, with who you, uh, that use CTI and then they may use this. However, they delivered very conflicting results. So we had two studies that didn't find any um, difference between the MDMA users and the controls at all. There was one study that found increased fractional anisotropy, so um, let's say increased white matter integrity, and there was one study that found decreased white matter integrity. Well. This was most probably due to methodological difficulties. I might, if I have enough time, I might also talk a little bit about this. What we, of course, tried with our study is to eliminate these methodological difficulties. So what were I, our hypotheses? Based on the animal studies, we expected decreased fractional anisotropy, or FA, in chronic, chronic MDMA users, meaning that we expected and they're made to be neurotoxic. And then our second hypothesis was that there was, would be a positive association between reductions in fractional anisotropy and MDMA use intensity. So we expected that those people that use more MDMA show more severe um, impairments in white matter integrity. This is a study overview. Um, well, an overview over the demographics and MDMA use variables of our sample. You can see on the top that we um, investigated 39 controls who were mostly drug naive that were allowed to have um, not more than 15 lifetime um, 15 lifetime occasions of illicit drug use, except for cannabis. And we had 39 MDMA users in our study. These were chronic users. They needed to have at least 25 um, lifetime occasions of MDMA use, but I'm going to show you in a minute that it was more for them at least. As you can see up here, we matched the controls after the MDMA group. So the two groups didn't differ in age, in sex, in years of school education, in verbal intelligence, and also in ADHD scores and in depression scores. And what's not listed here, but was, which was also the case, was that the two groups didn't differ in their nicotine use. 
Where they differed though, obviously, was in their MDMA consumption variables. Um, there were, I don't know the exact number, but there was at least one person who reported in the control group that he or she had used MDMA before, which you can see here, but if you compare it with the number of um, the doses or the use occasions of the MDMA users, which was a mean of 633 tablets, there's obviously a huge difference. These were the assessments that we did. Um, let me mention here very quickly that the study I'm presenting today is part of a very large study. So this is really only a small excerpt of what we did. Um, but these are the measures that are relevant to, the, to this talk. So we did a clinical assessment. That was because we, of course, wanted our participants to be healthy. So. Um, of course, we asked them for any severe medical conditions, we asked them for neurological um, conditions, head injuries, and so on. But we also did an assessment of psychiatric diseases, including an ADHD screening and a depression screening. We also did assess verbal IQ by a verbal IQ test. And what we also assessed very th thoroughly was substance use history. Um, so we asked them for their lifetime use of any psychoactive substance, including nicotine and alcohol and anything illegal and um, medication as well. So of course, substance use history was self-reported. So we also did a hair analysis, or we took hair samples, which we then analyzed. And in fact, there were people in the sample that reported to have consumed MDMA in the past four months that actually didn't. So that was very crucial to the study. And we also did urine sampling because people weren't allowed to um, consume any illegal substances four days prior to testing. And then, of course, the heart of the study, we did an MRI. On the picture, you can see the actual MRI that we used for the study, which is located at the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich. OK, then I just want to very briefly talk about the analysis that we did, because this is also very crucial to our work. I have already mentioned that we tried to eliminate some of the um, methodological difficulties that previous studies had. And this also includes the analysis that we did. So we did use a deep learning approach that creates these very beautiful visualizations. And I want to just very briefly explain what you can see on these pictures. So the method that we use is called tractometry. And it starts with tractography, where we would take the MRI pictures and create for each participant this whole brain model of white matter, um, white matter structure. You can see they are very colorful. That's because the colors indicate the direction of the nerve fibers or the white matter tracts. These are not individual nerve fibers. These are the white matter tracts. So for example, in the brain, um, in the middle of the brain, we can see the corpus callosum, which is in red, because red nerve fibers are going from the left to the right side or from the right to the left side. The next step then is bundle segmentation. So we would um, like take parts that are anatomically well-defined parts, white matter tracts that we know from the whole brain model for each participant. So in the end, we had 48 bundles per participant. Then the next step was that we segmented each bundle into 100 segments. And that led us to the final step, which were bundle analytics. Um, this is not an actual example from the final results, but I think it's a very good visualization of how these comparisons, this group comparison works. So in the end, we had each bundle for um, the MDMA group and for the control group. And for each segment, we then compared the MDMA user group and the control group. And those segments that are marked in yellow here would be the one that differ between the groups. So let's go to the final results. What we, find, uh, what we found was no evidence of MDMA-induced neurotoxicity. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 
in fact, what we found was increased fractional anisotropy in several white matter tracts of chronic MDMA uses. We expected fractional anisotropy to be decreased. Turned out, it's increased, at least in some segments. What we also found, what was also against so our priori hypothesis, was the negative correlation between MDMA use intensity and fractional anisotropy values in portions of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, you can see on the picture, this is the part where we found the most, most pronounced group differences. And actually, this effect of increased fractional anisotropy was most pronounced among weak and moderate uses of MDMA compared to those who use the substance more severely. Good news only? Well, I would say no, unfortunately. So, of course, it's very good that we didn't find um, that we didn't find these severe white matter lesions. And I have to mention here also that the same methodolo methodology was used in ketamine users and cocaine users, for example, and there we would, found, there we would find um, differences. Sorry. They were absent in our MDMA use sample. However, I mentioned in the beginning that we find um, differences between healthy controls and chronic MDMA users in other domains. So we find differences in neurocognitive uh, domains and we also find alterations in the molecular system of, like in the molecular, on the molecular level of MDMA users. So we have to keep in mind that, of course, although we couldn't show um, a decrease in white matter integrity, there are still alterations and the substance still bears some risk. What we also have to keep in mind is that the interpretation of the measures that we use can sometimes be a little bit difficult. So I already mentioned that with our study we tried to eliminate many of the methodological um, methodological problems that previous studies had. However, in these kinds of studies we have some problems that just aren't possible to eliminate. For example, that's the co-use of other substances. So if you try to recruit a sample of very heavy chronic MDMA users, it's very likely that people also use other substances as well. And although we controlled for this in our final analysis, and although we also tried to really only recruit those people that mainly consume MDMA, you cannot really 100% be sure in the end that effects are not confounded by the co-use of other substances and also lifetime factors. So for example, if there's somebody going to a rave each weekend, of course you have a different life than somebody who doesn't. Then there are also limitations inherent to DTI. So the animal studies that we saw at the beginning, their results were based on brain slices. So they were very fine grained. But in contrast, DTI doesn't show any changes on the nerve fiber level, but rather on the whole white matter tracts. So it's not as fine grained as the results derived from animal studies. Thus, we cannot be completely sure that there aren't very, very small, tiny changes that our methods just don't allow us to detect. And one last thing that I'd like to mention here is that the interpretation of increased fractional anisotropy is also not very easy. So our hypothesis was that we would find uh, reductions in fractional anisotropy, which we would have interpreted as um, white matter damage or damage to, to serotonergic neurons. Um, however, this measure, fractional anisotropy, is like an umbrella measure for many, many changes that can happen to the axons. For example, it could mean any changes in myelinization, and this is actually an interpretation that would be possible that MDMA leads to neuroplastic changes to the myelin sheets, which would probably be good news. 
Um, but there are also alternative explanations for this increase in fractional anisotropy. For example, it has been suggested that it could also mean an increase in cerebral blood flow in chronic MDMA uses. For the moment, as far as I know, we simply cannot tell. However, my last however for today, um, although we have some limitations in the methods that we used, what we can tell in comparison to other psychoactive substances, MDMA does not um, create, produce any severe white matter lesions, or that's at least what we concluded from our study and our study sample. So, at this point, I'd like to thank the whole study team, um, especially my supervisors, uh, Joshua Zimmermann, who will also be coming to the stage in a few minutes, and my supervisor, my professor, Boris Getno, and the postdoc in the project, um, David Cole, and also, of course, the other authors of the paper, and our interns who did a very great job in recruiting and um, data acquisition and many, many other things that we had to do for the, for the current study. And um, let me skip this slide and first show you the bi bibliography. So <laughs> if anyone is interested in having them in a bigger text size, you can always, of course, approach me and, and ask me for them. And yeah. That's it. So maybe if you've read through my uh, CV at the beginning, um, you've noticed that I'm currently doing scientific communications. And very recently, we released the first episodes of a very new podcast project, which is on philosophy and psychology. So if you're interested, um, you're very welcome to search for the podcast on any podcast portal. It's in German, unfortunately, but if you're German, sorry, <laughs> but if you're German speaking, you might be interested. There will be maybe more projects in, um, in English. Also, if you'd like to talk with me about your experiences with any psychoactive sub substance, you can also approach me. There will be a podcast project on that very soon. And with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening, and I'm now very happy to take your questions. I don't know if there's a microphone around for the question round. Yeah. <laughs> Just so it's in the recording. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the amazing talk. So, Thank you. like when you talk about chronic use of MDMA and all these things, that automatically pops the question of safer use uh, into my head. So, what would be your professional recommendation based on your research findings? Um, also, in the light of these. Neurocognitive findings, you also mentioned a little bit, so what would that mean for safe use of MDMA? Um, as we cannot do any research on this, as I already mentioned, of course, um, there is no like final guidelines on this, and it's also not what we um, researched in our study. Um, what we see, though, in animal studies is that higher doses and higher frequency of dosing has leads, rather leads to neurotoxic effects. So there's this, usually this recommendation of waiting for like three months so the serotonin system can, um, how do you say, rebound. Thank you. Um, I guess that is a tip I can give you. Um, besides that, I'm not an expert on safer use. However, I, I suppose you all know, but there are these great drug checking and drug information services in Switzerland that you can legally use. So I can really recommend that. Sorry, I hope this answers your question a little bit. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> well, if nobody else uh, wants to go, so um, since we do hopefully have a bit more time left, I would really like to know a bit more about these um, uh, yeah, methodological difficulties of all these other papers you touched up on, and can you maybe tell us a bit more about how your approach was 
yeah, offsetting these difficulties from the other ones. Mm -hmm. So there are many levels to this question. Um, I already mentioned that we used a more sophisticated approach on the analysis. So for example, earlier DTI studies used um, a method that's called TBSS. And there you have like a template of a brain. And for each subject, you pro project the FA values on that template, which doesn't account for inter-individual differences of brains that can, for example, hamper the um, analysis. That is only one part. Um, something that was lacking in some of the previous study was the co-use, uh, the, the controlling for the co-use of other substances, which of course is crucial to these kinds of studies. Other things were very technical. So for example, previous studies used 1.5 Tesla scanners, while we used a 3 Tesla scanner. Um, another thing were the diffusion directions. Earlier studies used way more, uh, way less diffusion directions than we did. So we had a way more like fine-grained um, analysis. I also saw one study that collapsed the brain hemisphere. So they just calculated them together and did the analysis on those. And of course, we did it like separately for both hemispheres. Some of the study only investigated a few um, regions of interest, so only a few brain regions, and we did it whole brain. There were a lot. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. That was very thorough. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? I have one myself, actually. Yeah. You said the whole brain. Um, I heard rumors about the rest of the nervous system. Uh, do you know anything about like um, damage that could be done to your nervous system that isn't the brain? I don't have, have any information on that. I'm sorry. But interesting question. I, uh, if anyone knows the answer, I'd love to know. <laughs> Still, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Before going into the break, yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, I also very much liked how you put one of your science communication projects, the podcast ca called Seldomly Asked Questions. And I think that's a very good point um, to, to focus on also when it comes to psychedelic research. It's like a train going through with all the benefits and benefits coming out. Uh, but at the same time, we have to reevaluate. We have to be very critical. We have to challenge the outcomes over and over again if we want to get to a long-term sustainable future of um, the, the, the use of psychedelic substances um, and I think it's it's very important to keep that in mind um, as much as we love these things and are convinced about them um, let's make sure that the euphoria is not taking over um, and taking away that critical thinking and challenging aspect even to the best of results because in the end it's like if you are making and forging a, a sword it's only with the repeated times of throwing it into the fire and hitting it and throwing it to the fire and hitting it, that it will get stronger and stronger. And if there's anything that we need for the future of psychedelic substances, for the future of mental health on this planet, then it is a fundamental and very strong core that is unbreakable and not flown away or blown away by the first wind that it's going to encounter.